men is to sleep, to die, to awaken. Sings a chorus of men, women, and children in their underwear in the middle of the night as they splash through the waters of the Rio Grande. They're crossing the border illegally from Mexico into Texas. They sing a requiem for the disappeared and the dispossessed that have attempted the passage before them. The world of dreams, the world of waking nightmares, fidelity, betrayal, love, hate, truth, lies, morality, immorality, good, evil, right, wrong, life, death. Between these human constructs runs, like the Rio Grande between two countries, a gray, turgid river Styx, a liminal zone that some people call the slippery slope. Others call it, I suppose, trial by fire, and still others simply identify it as daily life. In the opera Bandana, Miguel Morales, Othello, is the police chief of a small town on the USA-Mexico border. His lieutenant, Jake Iago, spends his off-duty hours spiriting people across the border illegally. Morales is married to a mestizo woman named Mona Desdemona. Her best friend, Emily, Amelia, is about to marry Jake. Kane, a Caucasian labor organizer from Chicago, is stirring up trouble. The action centers on the wedding of Jake and Emily, Amelia, and features the unfortunate planting of Mona's bandana by Kane and Jake in Cassidy's, Cassio's pocket, and the subsequent murder of Mona by her husband. Set on the Day of the Dead, the opera's unifying concept is the idea of the borderlines between emotional, metaphysical, and moral states. My librettist Paul Muldoon and I began by co-writing a highly detailed filmic treatment. Dramatic events were mapped out, and the amount of time, down to the second, to be spent on each was decided before I had composed a note. As a composer, I employed procedures and formal structures customarily used by commercial and Broadway songwriters, including so-called first and second eighths, various kinds of introductions, verses, bridges, and choruses, using the release of a melodic phrase to highlight the libretto's central image, and so forth. I chose musical lyrical structures that would best underpin or frame each dramatic event, and asked Paul to execute the scene using the verse or lyric structures customarily associated with those musical structures. Describing what I wanted by way of lyrics when possible, sending him actual examples from the song lyric canon of what I wanted when necessary. Throughout, I adhered to this maxim and its corollary. The longer an audience is in the theater, the slower it perceives time as passing, and the more important a dramatic event is and must be, the more time the audience should spend experiencing it. I created or dissipated dramatic tension by causing a substrata of song and dance forms to proceed below in the orchestra both in agreement with and in opposition to the onstage drama, whilst the demands and expectations of through-composed drama proceeding above in the voices. The College Band Directors National Association stipulated that, like the good soldier Schweik, the opera have abandoned the pit, at least for the first ten years. The broadly eclectic musical score embraced everything from Verismo to Berio-esque swingle singer style ensemble writing, modernist washes to vaudevillian set pieces, Scott Joplin-esque tangos to hard, crude 50s rock and roll. There was even a 12-note bandana chord based on the climactic death of tonality chord in the Mahler 10th symphony which welled up from the orchestra and hovered over each character like a sort of musical sword of Damocles at the instant at which she or he made their most fate-filled decisions. I 
Miguel Morales' music is consistently restless. There's a Weimar era fadedness to him, as though he intuits that he's a doomed man and that his world is ending. Lieutenant Jake is torn between the insipid love that he feels for his fiance Emily and the harder edged fury, obviously more dissonant, that he feels at being dominated by Morales. Kane, the labor organizer, is in most ways the least conflicted of all the characters. He's absolutely secure in his evil. Accordingly, the music he's given during the scene in which he seduces and discards a young woman is some of the most ardently diatonic in the show. Kane's seduction aria is a tour de force for any dramatic baritone and serves as the psychological nuclear reactor that powers the angry, raw, vivid dramaturgy of the entire show. Mona is by far the most aware of the inevitability of her impending murder by her jealous, possessive husband. She watches him emotionally unravel during the climactic wedding dance scene. Her willow song is unbearably extended, painfully intimate, and utterly without counterpoint. She sings to us as though from beyond the pale, even before she's dispatched there, strangled by her husband with an onion-stained bandana. them 
to fix that sign. It looks strange without the end.